Margaret awoke, startled, a cold sweat clinging to her. She gathered her thoughts. Aged wood creaked, echoing through the quiet rooms. Near the house stood a shrine to Rhea Dana, goddess and daughter of the land, of Rhea and a being of comfort. Margaret soft answers. But the goddess did not speak. There was only the faint whisper of something dark, something hungry. The old seer's bones felt the weight of their age as she climbed. The only thought on her mind, has it begun again? John's mission would be a simple one. He was to investigate Rhea's greatest shrine. His mother presented him with a fresh divinity shard. From his brother came a newly sharpened sword. His wife gave him a kiss, and his daughter's hugs were full of reason to return home safe. Forgotten, a place of unimaginable beauty. It first appeared as sludge given life, slithering creatures, small and vile. A wall impeding further progress, a battle was certain. abated, leaving the shard cold in hand, dark in need of life. The shard grew warm, humming softly from the harnessed energy. Before him was now one more dangerous than those that came before. Goblins, a familiar threat, albeit farther out than usual. Inherently violent and ill-bane, goblins are an unfocused, constant threat. Magnificent, but dangerous, a land of love found, of love lost. Before him was sacred ground, left untouched in days gone by. Remaining calm and collected, 
The shock of his heart skipping beats was concealed in expert fashion. Before him stood Linda, his eldest daughter, with bow and quiver at the ready, determined to do her part. daughter gathered their thoughts, their hearts heavier than before. How would they explain what they had witnessed? The ancient tree had been cut down. Together, father and daughter described the horror, the creatures dripping with decay that slithered into bodies stuck between life and death to bolster their ranks. Grandma Margaret confirmed what they all feared. It was the corruption. A cruel entity spoken of only with hushed voices. An ocean of darkness that flowed from the top of Mount Morta. And the Bergson's duty was to stand against this devouring deluge of death. Kevin was also eager to do his part in the family's fight. Especially when his older brother Mark was off somewhere. He was as much a guardian of their mountain home as any of them. She stood. If they were to reach the summit and destroy this evil, as the Bergsons of old had done in the past, they would need the assistance of the sanctuary. by Rhea herself. The sanctuary was a gateway to the mysterious lands around the mountain. Margaret pointed to the huge crystal at the center of the den, revealing their next task, to activate it and open the way to the source of the corruption. And once Rhea's three spirits are gathered on the grounds, the only gate to the top of Mount Morta open in this chamber. By himself, or with the assistance of those who loved him, John needed to gather the three spirits from their lands. Without them, he would not be able to stem the flow of the corruption. Halls of Anaidaya must be here, for she needs to be found. A celestial shard chipped directly from the ancient crystal in the sanctuary. It would be the Berkson's lifeline, a tether to pull them back home before death's fateful whisper. Filling the winding tunnels of the silk covered caves, the acrid taste of poison lingered in the air. Spiders. Linda told herself it was only target practice. As she readied her bow, they must find the spirit deep within the caves.
energy flowed around the room. Before the hero, an object of the divine. Love, truly a divine emotion, especially during dark days. Love had motivated this mother to lay down her life for her cub. Not all in the caves were refugees. Some were just traveling merchants. The strange looking shopkeep dusted off his clothes and tipped his hat. He invited them to stop by his shop later, promising something for all adventuring needs. All eight eyes studied the one who was so willing to walk into their own tomb. looming, Margaret asked Ben to prepare his workshop. He would have to take charge of enhancing the warrior family's weapons and armor. Although in the safety of the Bergson's house, the young cub was not yet free from danger. Exhaustion racked the animal's body, its chest heaving for even the smallest of breaths. The family believed several plants found deep in the nearby caves, combined together, could serve to remedy the situation. the top of Mount Water, their equipment would need to be of the highest quality. When light faded from the sky and most were fast asleep, Mary would write about her family, immortalizing them for future generations. Kevin's need to help all began when his elder brother Mark left the house. His brother was strong, making any near him feel safe. 
but he left Kevin. Though Uncle Ben knew what his nephew needed, a focal point for his aspirations. Lucy could spend hours with paper and pencil, giving life to objects she witnessed in the clouds, drowning herself in her own world, a place empty of life's trials and tribulations, away from Grandma Margaret, who's always insisting that she continue to practice her other specialty. A mother away from her child, cause worry even in the best of times. This was far from the best of times. It had been more than a year since Mark, Mary's eldest son, had gone to live in the monastery deep in the forest. The same forest was now the source of such worrying news. Pilgrims once lost in cavern mazes, now trapped. Their poor families forever looking forward to a return that will never happen. The halls of Anea Dyer, so mesmerizing in their magnificence, would be found at the end of a long road. And a hero never knows what is awaiting them at the end of a road. Moving is more important than reaching. Generous mushroom was vital to any concoction for the purpose of healing. While naturally poisonous, any skilled brewmaker could extract the important properties without danger. Tired of being called shady, he instead adopted the title Mysterious Shopkeep. What strange thing could have dragged grandmother this far? Will of rain will flow in those still obelisks to aid the guardians. This was the only thing Margaret silently whispered. And the Bergson had to return home in order to understand what had occurred. A set of daggers made just for him. They would be his guide to finding himself, his focal point. Tested them. They felt good. Not too heavy, not too light. Like an extension of himself. Uncle Ben suggested a few practice swings outside. The dagger sliced the air, guided with an easy grace. His nephew was clearly a natural with the blades and would be ready to join his father and sister in no time. But the boy's mother had words on that subject. Two of her children were already risking their lives, and she would not have her precious little boy out there as well. Regretfully, he took the daggers away. Who was he to argue with a mother when it involved her child? Handing over the daggers was like abandoning a part of himself. He was meant for them, meant to be out there fighting for what was right. He just needed to convince them. The mysteries of the world were like open books to the wise, and words from the wise shall benefit man and beast. Uncle Ben pondered over a map he received from a refugee. The silk caverns were a twisted maze of dead ends and venomous nests. But somewhere along the right path, Anea Dyer, spirit of the Caldipo Caves, rested.
Worried for the missing boy, Ben thought that maybe he should have hidden the daggers better. Margaret, in her wisdom, knew that nothing would have remained hidden from Kevin forever. Now, she only encouraged her son and his daughter to hurry and find him. Nothing could quite match the calm that Linda felt when playing her violin. Its sublime sound, the perfect counter to the nerve-wracking uncertainty and chaos. Death slowly beckoned to bestow its peace. A way had opened, a step closer to the spirit at the heart of the caves. Though before taking that step, caution dictated a return the newfound passage. Kevin returned from his saga with barely a scratch, yet he found no appreciation from his family, especially his father. Despite having Linda on his side, his father was still mad at him for endangering himself and worrying them all, including his pregnant mother. His favorite line, asking how he could be so inconsiderate. He wondered whether Uncle Ben would understand his bravery and initiative better. With his heroic act unrecognized, the young boy waited, frustrated, expecting more punishment. What Kevin had not expected was his parents' reaction. Heartened by his courage, his father was going to teach him the ways of battle, and his mother was far from the frail and always worried housewife she had seemed. A Berkson through and through, she gave him her blessing and asked only that he temper his courage with caution. Uncle Ben was the happiest of them all. Not only had his nephew held his own in combat, but had done so with the weapons he had made for him. Kevin only wished his older brother Mark was there to witness his rise to the family calling. Defeated, the Spider King had been removed from the path leading to the halls of Anaya Dyer. Although the pestering of greedy goblins might still prove dangerous along the way. Uncle Ben was pointing out possible routes forward, speaking of the troubles pilgrims had run into in the lost trenches. Always eager to fight, Kevin's new exercise resembled a dance more than a fighting technique. With all the noise he was making with his practicing, the family might have trouble sleeping tonight. soaked muck of these trenches with a path to the halls of Anaya Dyer. 
The further their quest proceeded, the more dangers there were to face. Even the dead had no claim to peace anymore. As the conversation turned to the progress of the corruption, Mary was curious to know which village had been attacked this time. However, that worry gave way to panic when Lucy entered. Poor beasts, all slaughtered. Maybe something had infected them. The corruption was on their doorstep now. The goblin bandits had been preying on Anaya Dyer's pilgrims with unprecedented cruelty, removing the evil to help those who had taken refuge in the cave. Ben had heard that the goblin sibling's lair was somewhere in the lost trenches. Berkson's had to deal with those two as soon as they could. The air vibrated with the pilgrims' chanted prayers. Prayers offered to a deity that perhaps slumbered, unhearing, at the end of their journey. The hero did not know how many of them would survive the coming days. While painful for a mother to see her son in sickness was still better than missing him for so long, Mary knew that she would make caring for Mark her mission. Mark had to warn them about the dangers approaching, despite how difficult it was to talk. He started naming the villages that were evacuated or worse, taken over by the corruption, but soon succumbed to fatigue and fell asleep. Mary recalled hearing of an herbalist in Caldipo Caves that would have the yarrow at hand needed to treat more. The Bergsons would once again need to brave the treacherous caves in search of the herbalist. This monstrous creature shouldn't keep me from finding the cure for the little cub, the Bergson thought. One fungus bulb harvested not the most pleasant of smells, but would give bite and power to any remedy. Wherever there was a secret, knowledge was to be gained in reward. And wherever there was a reward, danger lurked. The cipher was important enough that it brought Grandma here. Here's to being lucky, Grandma exclaimed with her unique sense of humor. The poor herbalist had no valuables, but the goblin's greed had now surpassed gold and jewels. Shedding tears for the dead man would serve no one now. The herbs needed to be delivered to Mary. Grandma arrived in time to reveal the contents of the tablet. The secrets of Rhea are in the hearts of the stones, and for those whose weapons guard the creatures of the wild, there are new arts of war to be learned. The creature that now threatened the hero was a crudely focused inferno of hatred and malice. If 
one raging beast is not enough. Surely, two were. Letting out a final rasping breath, the second beast became motionless. The poor creatures, twisted by the corruption, were finally able to rest. A path to be cleared of the corruption, the jewel of life to be restored, the realm of Anea Dia, mother of beasts and the goddess of waters. Before embarking for the spirit of the family must be informed of the newly opened passage. The goblin siblings lay dead, and the pilgrims were now safer in their caves. But the last step remained to be taken. The warriors knew only that somewhere in the expanse of the caves was the ancient halls of the spirit who would reveal new truths to them. Mark was out of the woods now, his fever gone, he was almost up and about. Welcome back, brother, said Kevin. avoided conflict over the years, living in harmony with nature, but as Uncle Ben was fond of saying, a Bergson would forget how to walk before they forget how to fight. As if night had become day, the cub showed no signs of its past struggles, with Lucy and he now simply dancing the day away. If the little wolf cub was to stay, it would need a room and bed of its own. All too happy to build it, Ben only required some wood and nails from nearby. Whenever he could find time, Mark was reading about herbs and salves, his interest in medicine inherited from his grandmother. The first guest to be summoned, Anai Dyer was to be found in the darkest depths of the Keltipo Caves. For a spirit to leave her domain, though, was no simple task. Bergson's hair stood on end and the ominous sounds of the unholy ritual Whatever it was, it would not be a happy affair. Grandma was already there, as always, before the Bergson could have a look around. Those who approach the light will gain more valuable experiences, was how the tablet was explained. Stone made living. 
finally free of the corruption's hold, Anaya Dyer gazed upon the Bergson, her emerald eyes weary with exhaustion. took life, forming images to reveal what was hidden from the Bergsons. And us, spirits three, knelt before the mountain god Ul to swear fealty. Our wills were set on peace. His was set on testing ours. And as the test drew to a close, we discovered our wretched ending. As the mountain god exacted vengeance on the children of Rhea Dana, and tainted Rhea with the corruption. Thus was another truth revealed to the Bergson, but many more were hidden still. Questions were abundant in the Bergson's minds. If the mountain god was the source of the corruption, what had made him wreak such havoc? How had no one known about him before? They needed to find the next spirit, as maybe they had an answer to some of their questions. More truths awaited them in the land of the winds. Never would a wolf cub live in as nice a house as the one Ben was building. When asked what name to put on the house, Lucy yelled out, Riker! Riker the wolf cub! Why would the mountain god corrupt the world? What kind of evil was it that brought it forth? For Margaret, these questions were as important as where and how. Nai Raha, spirit of fealty, awaited the Bergsons somewhere in Belahat. Next. Take the warriors there. Once a lively place of merchants was now only a back alley of broken promises and death. Deep in the city of thieves, the path to Anai Raha's halls awaited. <laughs> Lucy 
Linda felt a deep sorrow. She saw that her tree, the tree her father had planted the day she was born, had withered and died. Though when she looked upon her grandma, her sadness lessened. Margaret was always a glimmer of light in the darkest of hours. Mary's worry over bringing a child into this harsh world would not prevent John from making bad jokes. He would say, the baby does not seem at all worried, which was exactly what helped her keep calm. The truth hurts sometimes, and often the truth that hurts is hard to share. Margaret was wondering whether the world would just be a better place without the gods and goddesses. Their minds traveled back to Jovial, the celebration day all those years back in Barahat, the day they had met and their hearts played the same song, the day their eyes started to see nothing but each other. It was love that had sustained the Bergsons through thick and thin. I need your help, Sheila. If not for me, come to the aid of the family, for Mary and her children. And so Ben's letter ended. His doubts showing he contemplates his relationship with Aurora, the emotional and single-minded Sheila. Why had they ended? Question still unanswered. An answer cannot be expected to a question unasked. Nonetheless, the anticipation was exacting its price on Ben's soul. He wondered whether he should journey to Terra Lava, to Sheila. A hard decision that had now become even harder all the years he had spent inebriated. And yet another letter, this time more intimate. All Ben wanted was to hear something, anything, back from Sheila. He made no requests and made no mention of past events. Once again, he considered going to Terra Lava if no reply was forthcoming. The strain of carrying a light of Rhea is something Mary often hid, but even the strongest must rest. Berahat no longer hosted the bustling markets and many carnivals that it used to. The fact that frustrated Linda to no end Uncle Ben had heard from peddlers and other travelers out of Barahat that its ruler Bushra had left the day-to-day -day governing of her realm to a thief. The Bergsons had to find the criminal and teach him some decency. Estimating the age of Anai Raha's abode was perhaps as difficult as walking the road that led to it. But one question occupied the Bergson's mind most. What secrets 
the spirit of Barahut reveal. Rhea's mercy can make the impossible possible, is all Margaret whispered. Sometimes, just as you are getting ready to leave, someone arrives, and you stay for them forever. Sheila's ring drew Ben's attention. The same ring that Sheila had always said belonged to her firstborn. This man was their son? Ben could not stop staring into Joey's eyes, the eyes that he had gotten from Sheila. When Joey informed his father of the many years since his mother's passing, Ben's heart felt cold. In that single moment, with the single gulp he drank, the memory of all the years with her passed through his mind. Regret became his companion then. It was not the warmth of the drink, but his son's touch that brought him out of the coldness within. Sheila was dead, but their son was here. Nostalgia of days lost, mixed with dreams of days to come. He felt as if he was there when Joey had been born, when he had grown up and become the man he was now. Ben had already lost his wife, but that was in the past. And this was the future. A future they had to build now, together. Joey and Mark had not known each other for long. But as happens with some young men their age, a friendly rivalry was already taking shape. Sand swept across the land, scraping against the stone of a monument built not from devotion, but blood and sweat. Atop it stood a Nairaha, with the lost ruler Bushra waiting. Two people, one old and one young, surely did not belong in the clearing of windswept sand. The older was nervous looked at his surroundings as if for the first time. But an air of wisdom still lingered around him. They were on the run and in search of one more able-bodied than themselves. For a monstrous and savage creature had begun to dwell near the observatory. The creature that now threatened the hero was a crudely focused inferno of hatred and malice.
With the observatory now safe from the belligerent beast, the two were once again free to observe the heavens. Even fortune is in Rhea's hands, was all Margaret murmured. The old man explained that yesterday's secrets, and even tomorrow's legends, can be found written in the stars. Unfortunately, an eyeglass broken in yesterday's haste would not allow vision to tomorrow's unknown. The sage looked upon the Bergson for help. The nearby mines could luckily supply the materials needed to craft a new lens. All the young boy would need was someone to watch over him while he gathered them. replaced, the two turned back to the heavens, tomorrow's legend resting beyond the horizon, while yesterday's secrets hid nearby. The manipulator of the disenfranchised, the leader of rats, with fingers sharp as daggers, and the soul lacking its humanity. Chooses the life of the fool. The crystal was upon the hill of that. Through a path opened anew from the sacred city of Anai Raha, the spirit of wind and weather. Shhh! The strange weariness as home beckoned. The chamber groaned and trembled, darkness replacing light. Above, the family waited to eat, comfort replacing vigilance. The forest was dense and full of dangers, but finding Mary was the most important thing now. Somewhere out there, surrounded by the darkness, Mary and her unborn child lay in need. The Bergsons would find them.
creature roar. But flight was no longer on the hero's mind. Bergson now stood their ground, ready to take action. Disbelief was not a strong enough word, and denial was not a luxury they could afford. They knew all too well that Grandma Margaret was gone. A hero may fade, they never disappear. Their actions left to echo through an eternity, carried by those lives they touched. No one could believe that Grandma Margaret had passed away. The Bergsons shed their tears, hearts filled with sorrow. Ben and John were shocked to their core. The letter left by their mother spoke of a terrible secret, the one way to stop the corruption. The only way, she claimed, was to sacrifice their soon-to-be-born child to U, the god of Mount Mortar. It was unthinkable. Perhaps their mother had made a mistake, had somehow misinterpreted the signs and ciphers. John thought they should keep the letter a secret for now. John did not look up dreading even the possibility of having to look his wife in the eye. How could he tell her so terrible a truth? Mark did not know what the truth was, only that something horribly heavy was weighing down his father's spirit. And Mary, oblivious, was daydreaming about the child she would soon bring into the world. It was merely a soothing potion Mark sought among his grandma's books. But what he found was like a bolt of lightning through his heart. They would have to sacrifice the newborn babe to the mountain god to stem the tide of the corruption and save the world. Knowledge sometimes brings great suffering to the compassionate. still mourning the loss of their grandma, they had to continue with their mission. Two more spirits of Rhea needed to be freed and brought to the safety of their home. 
John thought they should be able to find the temple that housed an Iraq, the spirit of the rivers, somewhere in the city of Arahat. Maybe he could shed some more light on the nature of the corruption and the mountain god. Colossal monument built to the ruler of Berahat and the voice of Anay Raha, Bushra herself. A twisted prison of hate and decadence. The flying creature they were seeing in the sky filled Lucy with excitement. Could it be a dragon? However, Kevin had heard Mark say that there were no dragons left on Rhea, and he told Lucy the same. It wasn't hard for Uncle Ben to guess that this strange woman was from the far north. The Bergsons were curious to know her reason for making such a long and arduous trip down south. The details Apon knew about fighting the corruption surprised the family and stirred more than a little respect for her. Yet more surprising was the fact that the wife of a tribe chief would take unto herself to journey south and give aid to the Bergsons. Apon joining in with the Bergsons would help them in their quest. Moreover, Mark could learn a thing or two from her in the art of combat. On an evening just like any other, the old man appeared, followed by someone else. But it was not his apprentice. The man now carried the weight of two upon a body where youthful curiosity was replaced by remorse and obligation. He sought safe haven with the Bergsons so that he may discover something worthy of his son's legacy. When tormenting their own citizens was not enough, to crueler entertainment. Strange music played from another unwilling entertainer. The melody failed to hide the sound of her sizzling flesh. surprise the poor creature would immediately flee from her liberators. Mary had already started studying Margaret's books of potion making and recipes before the disaster had struck. She worked through them cautiously and patiently. After all, someone had to follow in Grandma's footsteps and help the family in their efforts. Thank you. 
The fruit lay before them, gathered out of gratitude. There was nothing but a few footprints to betray who may have left it there. Never before had the Bergsons seen, nor had they heard, such a vast trove of myth and legends. They were so mesmerized by Apon's storytelling that they spent the whole night transfixed as her audience. wish that their mother was alive was a shared longing for Ben and John. The younger son placed Margaret's staff on the same pedestal he had taken his father's sword from, his mind wondering about the truth of the horrific secret that their mother had left for them in her final letter. Soon, the Berksons would have to face Bushra, the villainous ruler of Barahut and lover of the Wind Spirit. Agitated, Ben was pointing out the passes that led to the halls of Anai Rahal. John, however, was lost in his thoughts, thoughts that only Mark could guess. What else would the oppressed slaves ask for in their prayers to the spirits of the land but a return to freedom and happiness? The Bergson wondered whether Anai Raha could answer the prayers or if his sleep proved too deep to even hear his people's cries. You are not holy? Just nothing but a rotten trunk, Ben was muttering angrily. No longer able to hold the terrible secret to himself, he told his son the painful truth about having to sacrifice the child that would be born soon, sharing the heavy burden, would hopefully calm him down. Lucy's warm embrace and her sweet kindness negated some of the chill the trials of captivity had left in Mary's bones. And when even that was not enough, her son's herbal teas sometimes helped. John's quivering voice was scaring Mary, making her fearful of what he might say. She started to feel the corruption inside of her. But the truth was far worse than her illness, worse even than her death, which she only prayed that would leave her be before her child was born. What was the unborn child's crime that it had to be sacrificed? Mary cried before fever stopped her from saying more. John tried to assure her, talking of uncertain fate and that they should not succumb to despair. After all, they were not defenseless against a future not yet here. They had two more spirits to find, and maybe they would offer a solution. Uncle Ben examined the unusually warm stone for some time. Intrigued as he was, additional stones with strange properties would be required. If any more appeared, they were to be brought to him immediately, for a machine of great importance could be fashioned from them. The sun baked the captive, nearly worked to death with such little water. But the shape 
pillar of stone without equal. He thanked the Bergs and asked to be visited if any wounds were in need of mending. The air touched him, filling him and ruffling his feathers. He looked upon the Bergson, small and fragile, but so full of hope. Infectious hope. Perhaps this would be the last time. words took life, forming images to reveal what was hidden from the Bergsons. And so it was their fate to do battle. The children of Rhea Dana, on the cusp of victory, would find their world overrun with the corrupted drowning men. And when they could fight no more, they would bow to Moon's demand. Mark tried to help with his knowledge of herbs, 
He knew that somewhere around Berahat was a tree, and an extract of its seeds might help stop Mary's chills and fever. But Berahat had surrendered to the corruption, and not even the trees were safe from it. Each time Kevin dabbed his mother's forehead with a wet cloth, he could feel her breath coming a little easier. He would do it forever if he knew it would make her well. The beauty of the ancient ruins was still evident through the decay brought on by time and sand. But once humble living quarters now slums, the muck of the corruption. The tree of prosperity is withered after twisting away Maria's womb. were looking for. No time to waste. Mary was waiting. A sip of the potion was enough for Mary to open her eyes and for John to exhale with relief. Unbidden, pain shot up Mary's spine and filled her eyes. Something other than her illness. The baby was coming. It was time. The air was suddenly still. Mary's sickness had made them forget that the ravenous mountain god was after their baby. Curse. John held her for the very first time. She was crying the song of life. Life was all that went through her father's mind. How he wished that he could give his own life instead of his baby's. But his life was worthless to the cruel god. Mary burst into tears. She feared that John was going to give up their baby to save the world. A world that at this moment was worth nothing at all to her. What chance did the Bergsons have against this monstrous cruelty of an immortal god? What a rotten fate that had doomed them to this destiny. How could John accept this heinous cycle of looming apocalypse and child sacrifice? His whole body shook from the conflict inside him. Every glance from his family was like a mortal wound to his heart. Would they let hope die this day?
this could not be the end. No. Grandma had already sacrificed herself for them. There would be no more sacrifices. Together, they were going to break that cycle and defeat unjust fate. And the look in their eyes became one of resolve. For life, for hope. Would their decision bring even more of the mountain gods' corrupted wrath upon them? They worried together, but each time they looked at Hope and saw her smile, resolve and belief in a better future would ease their worry. Was not defending their home more important than saving yet another spirit? Was there any other way to defeat Wu? Many questions remained without answers. They knew of no other way to free the final spirit, the spirit of dreams. One who could answer more of their questions. The industrial district of Teralava. A city with no time for daydreams, where machines continued tinkering away and Ane Sarava's chamber resided. Never the ones to forget to have a little fun when given the chance. The magma in the distance acted as lights for the city. In the center, they had my Salama, the intelligent, trapped by his own creation. The final key to the mountain guard. Nothing but mud and silt. Maybe they had to go deeper to reach water. It occurred to Ben that the old digging equipment may be of use. never surfaced, stuck behind two inoperative pumps out of reach. The man warned that both pumps needed to be activated soon after each other. A faint sound of trickling water beyond the rocks. Expelled in a 
exultant shouts as clean water once again returned to those most in need. Gears continued to crank on in the distance. The city must survive. Even more soulless than before, without life, and as if none had ever existed within the gears, and a new road forward opened with the jewel of life. Lucy's quiet snoring calmed her nerves, reminded by her younger sister that it was possible to be afraid of nothing, or at least not to lose sleep over nothing. The darkness threatened to overwhelm them, but they needed to unshackle the last spirit as soon as possible. Free of his earthly shackles, Ane Sarava still remained a prisoner of his own creation, Area 30, his workshop, and Jin's birthplace. All that effort for naught, there was no water. They desperately needed an alternative. No one seemed able to make a decision, and Mary was almost at her wit's end. Help, though, sometimes hides in places that you do not expect. A curious automaton rummaged through a pile of scrap. It was fully machine, but more human than its hostile Ilk, appearing as an innocent little girl. What was such a fragile child doing alone down here? Taking the small girl, just like any other bully. And a Berks knows how to deal with it. Common foe defeated, the little automaton's trust 
was her. Dust and decay hung in the stale air. The man sat motionless. Silence could not reply. Nothing remained for the little automaton in the hollow room. It was all alone. Sarava, the architect of Terralava, and the creator of the gym, the machine meant to serve the land, not oppress it. Harava was free again. As the spirit gazed upon the family, he felt something different, something unusual. Perhaps this could indeed be the final cycle. The spirit's words took life, forming images to reveal what was hidden from the Bergsons. Excitement filled the empty space. The promise made was now a promise fulfilled. The rock appeared on the horizon and the boundless wonder ended. journey had met destination. And the vagabond son of the heavens became the mountain god. His heart skipped, his mind echoed with music. His breath caught when the daughter of Rhea stole his heart. And carved it with her name, Rhea Dana. Two became a pair, mates joined in happiness. Who willed to elevate Rhea's creatures? From her wisdom, three spirits were created to guard the eons. 
and they lived a thousand years in bliss. Until Rhea Dana bore him a daughter. The mountain god could not stand her as he envied the child. Furious, he raged at Rhea Dana. And she left him. He wore the grudge as if it were a crown, one made of corruption, cursing the name of Rhea Dana's daughter. He descended into resentment. Thus was the truth revealed to the Bergsons and the origin of the corruption. She did not speak, just sat there in silent sorrow. And try as they might, the family could not console little Automaton. Pity or anger, the Bergsons stood shocked, not knowing how to react to the story. The important thing, however, was to break the cycle of evil. But they still did not know what awaited the children of Morta in the temple of the mountain god. Much to the birds and surprise, the enemy of their enemy was only another small automaton. The same human grief clung to this little one as it did the one back home. Coincidence, it was not. The two little automatons were surely connected. But another was yet to be found. Final little Ozzaton. And the most need of help. Anatomist, so still as if time around him had frozen. Uncle Ben repaired his body, but it was their presence that brought him back.
They were built as a family, and a family they shall stay. Their final destination was on the other side of that gate. The ending was nigh. Mountain God U himself, without Rhea Dana's love, the darkness had swollen inside him, consuming and uncontainable. Final step, love must prevail over hatred. <laughs> The 
Supreme One, master of all and master of nothing. His greatest fear was made absolute. He was left alone. Left alone to his misery and failure, to the unending cycle of despair and pain. He wished for its end, wished to bathe in an eternal darkness. Mercy prevailed as the wheel had turned back to kindness. That which was expelled from the heart returned. All the time apart, melting away, along with all the pain, all the sadness, and all the misery. Land met sky, two became one. Love ignited rapture as innocence flooded the space between breaths. Happiness and curiosity weaved, mixed and tangled in a dance a millennium in coming. Ascended, but will never leave. A family looked upon the mountain and land over which they were given ward. A family left exhausted was now more complete than before. A god once stricken with grief was now whole. And a land once cast into chaos is now left in serene balance. As the story comes to its conclusion, remember this. When the time spent in this land is looked back upon, when daring feats are recited along with victories and defeats, Remember that it was not a tale of heroes or villains, nor of good and evil, but one of family, and above all else, a tale of love. Go now, Guardian, and never forget. <laughs>